this eerie feeling in the music they play, like, while telling the story, and, like, just everything about it, it just, like, you know, like, it, it, like, makes me uneasy, you know, like, I, it gives me the chills, like, I, I don't like watching true crime, mainly because of the music, because, like, the music is, like, they pick, like, such, like, I don't know how to explain it, like, weird music, like, a weird, I don't know, anyway, so, this chapter, chapter six, <laughs> is on Gary Heidnick. never heard of this guy either, but, um, yeah, and the next chapter is, well, actually, I don't think we're gonna get to the next chapter, because this is, like, like five pages. So, anyway, notable fact. This is what I was talking about. They have notable facts on them, too. Did I ever say that in the last video? I don't know. Anyway, this one says, indeed, Heidnik was cooking something. It was not his dinner, but the ribcage of a human being. or something. If only he had not accepted the 
Asian Bunstead had insisted on being let in. I'm kind of hurting my rib cage. I'm like leaning on like the handle of the chair, whatever. Indeed, I Nick was cooking something. It was not his dinner, but the rib cage of a human being. That's the notable fact or whatever. I think it's a good, I don't know. The colony. The details as they were revealed later were to be some of the most shocking that Philadelphia could ever have imagined. <laughs> in, a sen in essence, Gary I. Nick ran a mini slave colony of African American women in his basement, keeping them chained, abusing and beating them. Feeding them a blend of dog food and human human flesh I'm sorry I should have like said a disclaimer at the beginning of this disclaimer from cleaner disclaimer from here on out because it's gonna probably be some like nasty stuff I'm reading so if you're like sensitive or don't I don't like how the light keeps changing in the back okay whatever Anyway, yeah, if you're really like sensitive about this topic, then um, disclaimer, click out of the video. Um, which the starving women were ultimately forced into eating by their hunger and sexually abusing them. I don't even know what to say about that, like what the actual fuck. Um, it all started with Josefina Rivera, a slim prostitute with a pretty hard face on november 26 1980 why is it always the 1900s it's always the 1900s i mean it's glad i'm i'm glad it's not like this time because obviously they would still be alive but like why whatever anyway on november 26 1986 she was working with she was working the corner of 3rd and Garrard, Garrard Streets, and hoping to meet a John. All told, it had been a miserable night for Josephina. She had an argument with her boyfriend, Vincent Nelson. She was broke, and in an hour or so, it would be officially Thanksgiving Day. The night, too, was miserable, cold damp and windy. She was wearing a thin jacket and her thin legs were encased in skin tight jeans. I hate skinny jeans. They're so uncomfortable. I prefer mom jeans, sweats, or leggings. Because obviously. Anyway, she hoped she would turn at least one trick, but as, as time went by, her prospects got dimmer. There were few Johns cruising by that night. Then she noticed that a Cadillac Coupe DeVille stopped. The window lowered electronically, and the driver, a middle-aged white man, asked her what she charged. She gave him a high figure, and they eventually settled on 20 bucks. He invited her into the car, and she got in. He dressed in a French leather jacket and wore a Rolex. Okay, rich. The car was fairly new and heavily customized with chrome. Josephina figured that the man had money to spend. He told her he was going to take her to his house. They stopped to buy coffee and then... And then he drove at Daytona 500 speed through the empty, wet streets to his house on North Marshall. Heidnick's house was different from many homes in the area, although the house was run down. It was also run down. It stood alone for from most houses which were attached to another home on one side and it had a dilapidated garage which other homes did not astonishingly enough in that garage was a 1971 rolls royce this man had the money okay the garage doors were lined with steel to protect the car against errant shots from drug dealers shootouts a few years earlier, Heidnick, who had a genius IQ and was brilliant at playing the stock market, he paid $17,000 cash for it. For the... Wait. 
just for it being like bulletproof, I don't know, a withdrawal that hardly dented his money market account with Merle Lynch of more than $500,000. In the house, Eidnick brought Josephine up, Josephina upstairs to a bedroom, the dominant feature of which was a waterbed. <gasps> Literally, waterbeds are so cool, but I feel like it would be hard to sleep on because, like, you're if you like toss and turn during the night, you're just gonna be like on the bed, you know, and it's gonna be like you're gonna like wake up to just you going. <laughs> <laughs> But I've always wondered what, um, oh my god, and if you accidentally poke it during the night, you're gonna drown, I'm kidding, you're not gonna drown, but you know, you're gonna be like soaking wet and everything around you is gonna be soaking wet. He paid her the agreed on $20, then took off his clothes and got in bed with her. They had, an, they had inter intercourse for a while, and then suddenly I Nick changed, changed. He grabbed Josephina around the neck and started to choke her. Terrified, she said she would do whatever he wanted her to do if he would let her live. He led her downstairs to the first floor, then down another flight of stairs into the basement. A dark and dingy place with a dirt floor. Suddenly, suddenly he had cuffed her hands and the cuffs were secured to a chain, which in turn was linked to a metal bar that ran the length of the ceiling. She was like an animal in a pen. Then he went upstairs and went to sleep. That's it. You're just like, I'm going to chain you down in my basement and, and, and hold you hostage and go to sleep. Whatever. Three days later, I Nick brought another woman downstairs. She was African-American too and plump. Her name, Josephina learned, was Sandra Lindsay. Like Josephina, he cuffed and chained Sandra to the metal bar. Then the sex started. Every day from that point on, Heidnick had sex with both of them, including intercourse and other acts. He seemed insatiable, ins I don't know how to say it, insatiable and liked humiliating and dominating the women. A particular favorite was forcing one to fillet him. I don't know what that means. While the other walked. He only abused them physically, beating them for no apparent reason with his hands and sticks. It was long before it wasn't long before the women were totally cowed and completely terrified of him. He didn't exactly lay out a regal repast for them either. Sometimes he gave them oatmeal for breakfast or pop tarts or crackers. For lunch there would be sandwiches sometimes and sometimes a special treat was takeout chicken. I mean, to be fair, takeout chicken is good. Sometimes. He also offered them sandwiches made with dog food, which they rejected, but then, as their hunger deepened because Eidnick refused to feed them, they accepted the dog food sandwiches. Sandwiches. To compound their grief, it was winter and the basement was chilly and damp, and neither women was dressed warmly. Indeed, at one point, they were bare from the waist down. More... Why was I about to talk regularly? <laughs> More prisoners. Three days before Christmas in 1986, Heidnick captured a new girl. Her name was Lisa Thompson. And she was 19, year, 19 years old. Dude, she's not even like an adult. Nineteen years old, a nice-looking young young woman. She was walking down Lehigh Street. Lehigh, Lehigh. I don't know how you say it, street when her life intersected with Heidnick's. He was cruising along in his Cadillac and pulled up beside Lisa and asked ingenuously, "You want to see my Peter?" Imagine someone rolling down there, like in now time. Not back then, like now. And a guy asking, like, just shh. You want to see my Peter? <laughs> I'm sorry. 
are literally what the actual heck. Lisa responded that she was no prostitute and that she was just on her way to her girlfriend's house. Okay, slay girly, but like, he ain't gonna take no for an answer. I think assured her that he was not dangerous and that he would be happy to give her a lift. Like, some stranger just rolls up next to me and like, hey, wanna see my Peter? And then you're like, no, like, I'm on my way, I'm going somewhere. And he's like, all right, can I, can I give you a lift? No, you're like, you're literally a stranger. I'm not gonna get in a car with a freaking stranger, like. That is, you're asking to be kidnapped then. I mean, I guess that's what Ubers are. But, it, that's not an Uber, you know, just some random guy. Anyway, um, before, wait, okay. After some discussion, Lisa decided he was harmless and got into the car. Wrong move, girly. You made the wrong choice. You're dead. Before they got to her destination, I Nick took her to a restaurant for a cheeseburger and fries, <laughs> flashed a roll of bills, and asked her if she wanted to accompany him to Atlantic City. Why would you go with a random person to a city alone with them? Um, anyway, when she responded that she had nothing to wear for such and outgoing, I Nick said he would be happy to buy her whatever she needed. He took her to a store and bought her an armful of jeans and blouses. I mean, you can do that to me, you know, like, take me, but like, you're not taking me back to your house, like, the fuck? Got me effed up if you think I'm, if you think I'm going to a stranger's house. Me not knowing anything, like I met them two seconds ago. Be for real. Um, after that, they went to his house. Oh my god. After that, they went to his house and had sex on his waterbed, where eventually she fell asleep. Like, I, j I need to, like, stop for a second. Why? Like, you don't know anything about him, and you're already going to his house. Like, I just, why? Why would you choose to go to a stranger's house not knowing what could be there or what was awaiting you? Like, I just, I don't understand. When she woke, she asked Night Nick to take her to her girlfriend's apartment. <laughs> Sorry, I have an itchy nose. Again, I Nick changed from a seemingly harmless man to something else. He, sorry, if you were that. He grabbed her around the throat and choked her. Later, Court Wax would dub this the I Nick maneuver. <laughs> Lisa begged him to stop and said she'd do whatever he wanted. <laughs> I think I would just let him choke me, to be honest, and kill me because I would not do whatever he wanted. Like, I would not. Go to his basement and be his slave. I would rather die than be out there. Clothless. At least from the waist down. Because that's what they said. And eating dog food. Human combination sandwiches. Uh, like... Sorry, my nose is like so itchy. <laughs> These allergies are no joke. Um, anyway... <laughs> So he took her down to the cellar and introduced her to Josephina, who had told Heidnick her name was Nicole and Sandy. Oh. Oh, okay. So, I was confused when I read that. Okay, so, Josephina told that, told, um, Gary Heidnick that her name was Nicole, so she was lying to him, basically. Oh, she was like him. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> My nose. And then Sandy, that was down there. Then he humiliated Lisa in front of the other women. He told her to kiss his behind, which she did. And then, and he then for 
forced her to quote unquote suck my balls, which she also did then to suck my Peter, which the girl also complied with afterward. I Nick served peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, something of a treat, and completed his day's work by cuffing and chaining Lisa to the metal bar. I didn't even like I like I don't even like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Like well actually I haven't had one in forever. I kinda wanna try one again because I feel like I've seen like British people and like everyone or not everyone, but like a lot of people from the UK um like trying like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and they're like they're like amazed by it. like they think it tastes so good and now they're making they're like gaslighting me <laughs> into thinking that they taste good. So I'm gonna have to try it again. <laughs> anyway, where was I even at? <laughs> Heidnik's fourth cap captive was Deborah Dudley, Dudley, and his fifth was eight year old. Eight year old! Eight, I'm sorry, eight years old. An eight year old. Be fucking for real! I'm sorry, excuse my language. An eight-year-old be so for real. Oh, oh, wait. I'm sorry, 18-year-old. <laughs> I... Just like saying... Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, I swear that said eight. These words are changing. Eight-year... 18 years old, 18 year old Jacqueline Askins, taken just four days after Dudley. Askins was a prostitute, Dudley was not. Oh my gosh. It was midday when I Nick, driving a blue Dodge van, especially if someone had a van, they rolled up to me in a van. Or if it's the type of van I'm thinking of, like one of those creepy white vans. But there's also like the minivans that like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, it was midday when I Nick driving a blue Dodge van with imitation fur interior picked Askins up. When he got her to his house, he dragged her into the basement in which, and with the other captives watching, thrashed her into thrashed her with a plastic switch and then chained her up. He now had five African-American female prisoners in his basement and some of them had been in there for months. Imagine being in the basement chained up all day for months. No, I would have just let him strangle me. Like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Sometime during all this, I Nick had devised a special punishment for the slaves who don't did not obey them, him, or whom he decided did not obey him. He dug a hole in the cellar floor and covered it with a plywood panel <laughs> to discipline someone. He would make her get into a, the hole. Then he would cover. He would then cover the hole with the plywood and weigh it down with sandbags. It was an ordeal within an ordeal. It also may have served as inspiration for the author Thomas Harris, who had his fiction, fictional psychopath in the book The Silence of the Lambs. Hold women captive in a deep well, like hole in his basement. Heidnik's sexual, sexual activity continued and it often involved humiliating the women. For example, he would occasionally force the women to have sex with one another while he watched. Dog food eventually became a staple in the women's diet, but all still lost weight, and of course hunger was with them all the time. They certainly didn't lack for music. I kept the radio blasting rock music 24 hours a day. This was one reason why they had determined screaming would not have helped them. No one would be able to hear them above the music, despite all of Heidnik's sexual activity, none of the women became pregnant, though there were a few false alarms when two missed their periods. I Nick had been forced to buy tampons for all the women. Later, it would be determined that I Nick's main goal was to impregnate them. He viewed the basement as a kind of baby farm, but he was unable to achieve that goal. Good. There's no telling how he would have reacted if one of them had become pregnant. At the bottom, a death, something eventually occurred that made the situation in the basement particularly terrifying for the abused women. Sandra Lindsay died on February 7th, 
Agnes' trust. Indeed, she had shown her loyalty when he abducted Agnes Adams. Josephina was in the car when Heidnick encountered Adams for the third time. Agnes knew Josephina as Vicky from the Hearts and Flowers strip joint. Josephina made no attempt to warn Agnes that she was dealing with a man, madman, so Agnes felt that it was safe to go with them. So when Josephina asked Heidnick if she could see her children and family, he said she could but that if she didn't return, all the other women would die. Heidnick drove her into town, and she agreed to meet him at a gas station at midnight at 6th and Gerard Streets. She also promised to bring another woman with her. After Heidnick released her, Josephina Rivera immediately ran four blocks to the apartment of her boyfriend, of her boyfriend Vincent Nelson. So it's been months since she's been there, and... He, she gained his trust, and he's letting her go out on her own. Like, to be honest, I would, like, not come back, and I would, like, call the police. Like, call the police right then and there. Like, right when I got to my boyfriend's house, my non-existent boyfriend. Uh, but, you know, like, I'm saying if I was in her position, you know. <laughs> He was there hysterically. She blurted out the story out of nowhere she had been. And the war is at 3520-3520 North Marshall Street. The boyfriend was skeptical, but after a while, he began to believe her and told her to come with him. He would comfort Rydnick. Why would you... Oh, my... Why would you confront him? Is he stupid? I'm sorry. He would confront Heidnick at the gas station and beat him up. What is that going to do? What is that? You should have called the police. On the way over, though, he had second thoughts about the solidity of his plan, and they called 911. Yes! That's what you should... If you're... If you got told by somebody that you have not seen in months that they've been kidnapped... Like you're hearing it from them and you're like oh let me go confront this man and beat him up don't freaking do that you're not gonna win you're probably gonna die literally call the police call 911 like don't be stupid the responding uniform on er, uniformed officers dadded river a story too until she showed them the marks made by the chains and cuffs. They all went to the gas station and found Gary Heidnick in his car. He was arrested without incident. Yes! Yeah, so. On March 25th, 1987, Philadelphia detectives armed with a search warrant entered Heidnick's house. Downstairs, they found three women in the basement. Two of them, Lisa Thompson and Jacqueline Askins were huddled under a blanket trying to keep warm. They screamed hysterically and when they stood up, the blankets dropped off and revealed that they were nude from the waist down. The cops found Agnes Adams in a hole. She was nude, her handcuffs, her hands cuffed behind her back. During the search of Heidnick's house, one detective got an unpleasant surprise. He found the package to human flesh, the human fatty remains in a burnt pan, and on a shelf in the freezer, a human forearm. Heidnick's story. This is the backstory part. Heidnick was born in Cleveland in 1943 and had one sibling, a younger brother, Terry. His mother, Ellen, a nice looking woman who was part Native American, was an alcoholic who slept around. When Gary was two years old, his parents divorced. After the divorce, the divorce Gary and his brother lived with their mother but she soon seemed incapable of taking care of them. It's a lot of reading, whispering, whispering reading. I don't know. Around the time they entered the first grade, the boys went to live with their father, Michael, who had remarried. They would not live with their mother again, who married, who married three more times before committing suicide by ingesting mercury in 1970. Gary had described his father as cold and uncaring, a strict disciplinarian, but a psychiatrist 
who spoke to Gary said that his description of his father is a gross under his understatement for for example when Gary or his brother wet the bed his father would hang the sheets out the window to show the world what piss asses they were or he would paint bull's eyes on the brother's pants and show the other boys at school where to kick them Oh my god. And if Gary or Terry were really bad, punishment could be just about anything, including being hung out the window by the ankles. Gary's father was totally uncaring when it came to his sons. Indeed, when Gary was arrested, his father acted as if Gary had brought all his troubles on himself. And when Gary was sentenced to death, his father, who had not talked to Gary in 25 years, said, I'm not interested. I don't care. It doesn't bother. It don't bother me a bit. All I want is for you people to leave me alone. I don't care what happens. Gary and Terry were in and out of mental institutions going or institutions throughout their lives. And both brothers had tried to commit suicide on a number of occasions. Terry had tried it just a few times, but Gary had tried it. 13 different times using everything from driving his motorcycle into a truck to stocking pile stockpiling thorazine while he was in the hospital and trying to overdose on it. Growing up, Gary was extremely interested in the military and finance. He actually attended a military high school for a couple of years. He had been reading the financial pages since he was a kid and as an adult he used his intellect and experience to amass a small fortune in stocks okay last page this is getting kind of long and long video he was arrested a few times for assault and did prison time but overall he spent the bulk of his years in mental mental institutions and just about everyone who examined him considered him dangerous schizophrenic and incurable one particularly startling symptom was that he sometimes went mute did not utter such as a word for almost two years afraid of women i think also seemed to be afraid be afraid of women who were his intellectual equals, and even women of average intelligence, except for a brief marriage to a woman of average intellectual for two, for years. Before he abducted women to be his slaves, he became involved with women, only who were very intellectual, intellectual, intellectually inferior to him. One, for example, had an IQ of 49. A person with an IQ of 70 or below is considered to have mental retardation. Yeah, this was part of a broader pattern of constantly getting involved with people whom Heidnik could feel superior to, where his father had power uh, and superiority over him. Gary associated with people over whom he could feel power. Afterward, Gary Heidnik was found guilty of murder and was sentenced to die in the electric chair. All of these um, chapters that I've read was their, them just dying in the electric chair or just dying in prison. I don't know. Before his execution, he was housed in the state correlate correctional institution at Pittsburgh because of a change of venue granted to the defense during the trial. Since the age of 14, Heidnik had been in 21 different mental institutions and had tried to kill himself 13 times. People who knew him well predicted well predicted that he would go for number 14, but he never got the chance. He was executed on July 6th, 6th of 1999. This is where the, I end the video. This is getting way too long. Oh my gosh. This is the longest um, video I've ever made, but I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, um, definitely leave a comment below um, if you want me to read, like, or if you have any 
any suggestions of killers you would want to hear about, um, there might be some in the book. Um, in the next video that I read, I'll probably tell you guys all the killers that are in the book. Um, and you can choose whichever one you'd like to hear. But if you guys like the video or enjoy the